um, to others who, who might want to check out the, the presentation um, on their own. Um, so our agenda for today, um, I'll just start off with some sort of overview, talk about why digital storytelling. Um, then we're going to do a, an interview activity led by Aaron from Voices of Witness and hear a little bit about um, what, what Voices of Witness has to offer. Um, Aaron's worked with several teachers in FES, SFUSD facilitating podcasting projects. Um, so uh, she's a great resource. Um, then we'll be doing a group podcast activity led by Jostin from Soundtrap and you'll actually be creating a, an intro for a podcast in, in groups. Um, and then KQD, Rachel from KQD is going to um, present on a couple um, resources they have, a really exciting project opportunity through the Election 2020 Youth Media Challenge, and then some of their um, resources through the KQED Media Literacy Courses that you can use to support your own learning as you um, design and implement digital storytelling uh, um, projects in your, in your classroom. And then we'll have some time for you to engage in some project design, share with a, a, a colleague and get some feedback. Um, and then finally, uh, I'll share the application for the PLC sign up. So super excited to be launching this, this PLC um, in, in partnership with KQD and Voices of Witness and, and Soundtrap. Um, so people who participate in the PLC are going to get free access to Wii Video and Soundtrap um, for both themselves and their students. Um, you're going to have an opportunity to uh, receive feedback and support from colleagues through the process of designing projects and implementing projects and getting feedback. Um, you'll have an opportunity to showcase uh, your project and, and your student media to, to an audience. Um, you'll have an opportunity to receive professional learning from the Department of Technology, KQED, and Voices of Witness and earn Prop G hours. Um, we're also looking into possible credits towards the step in, in the pay scale. Um, so I'll, I'll follow up with that when I have clarity. Um, requirements for participating in the PLC are to attend the, the three meetings that we'll have throughout the year plus the exhibition. Um, and then to complete work towards earning three micro credentials um, through KQED uh, by implementing deeper learning aligned audio or video projects. Um, and so just by implementing these projects, you'll, you'll have done the work to, to, to apply for these three micro credentials. Um, and then highly encouraged are for people to participate in, you know, at least one KQED Media Academy educator course, um, which you'll be hearing about later on. Um, I've linked the PLC overview doc. If you want to read more about the, the professional learning community, um, you can check that out. Okay, so I um, just want to talk a little bit about why digital storytelling is important and, and to start by grounding ourselves in this concept of the digital use divide. Um, when we think about equity in terms of technology, we often think about equity of access and the importance of people having access to devices and, and uh, reliable Wi-Fi, um, which we know is a problem that we're solving for uh, as a district. Um, but there's also the importance of us designing, as, as educators, of us designing instructional experiences that provide students with opportunities to build critical 21st century skills um, that prepare them for the job markets that they're going to be entering into. Um, where they have the skills to create media, collaborate with peers and experts, code, design, etc. Um, so obviously this, uh, you know, this PLC is really focused on the media production skills, um, but also other skills around collaboration um, and things of that nature. Um, just wanted to share this quote from cultural critic and feminist bell hooks, oppressed people resist by identifying themselves as subjects, by defining their reality, shaping their new identity, naming their history, telling their story. And just to talk about how with, through digital storytelling, we really have the opportunity to center students as drivers of their own learning and create opportunities for them uh, to elevate youth voice and for them to elevate the, the voices of their communities and construct counter narratives um, to some of the damaging uh, narratives that uh, pervade our society. Hey Stu, I hate to interrupt you, but I, your slides aren't advancing. Oh, and I don't know if everyone's in the same boat as I am, but we, oh, they, here we go. Yeah, that's, they are. I'm so sorry. Thank you no, for no, catching no, that. No I, was, I, had a, I appreciate that. I had paused my sharing while I was um, waiting. So um, I won't repeat all that information, um, but here's a slide with just the overview of um, the PLC requirements and, and um, benefits and, and um, recommendations. And then I had just shared this graphic talking about this concept of the digital use divide and, and facilitating um, equity of opportunity for students to build 21st century skills. 
then oops, and this quote by um, Bell Hooks. So we're caught up. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> um, and so, and when when we when we do that, when we think about elevating um, youth voice and and youth telling their own stories and elevating the, the stories of their communities, um, I love this graphic uh, from Ron Berger thinking about. Uh, motivation and engagement and the ways in which audience plays into increasing or decreasing motivation and engagement. And at the bottom of this pyramid is presenting to a teacher to fulfill a requirement, which is what we often do. Um, and, you know, as we move up from students being able to present to their parents or their school community or audiences beyond their school, people uh, capable of critiquing, um, it's really up here where students have an opportunity to be of service in the world and make an impact and feel the kind of empowerment that comes with, with um, recognizing their power to enact social change um, that we really see, you know, the highest levels of motivation engagement. So I just want to encourage people on thinking about designing digital storytelling uh, projects to think about, you know, how, how can students really reach an authentic audience and make a difference, make an impact through the media that they're creating. Um, and this is an example project from uh, one of our teachers at SOTA, Bruna Lee, who um, hopefully will be joining this uh, PLC um, that she did last year where she uh, had students create um, podcasts humanizing a story. They had a lot of choice in terms of the topics that they, uh, that they focused on and the people that they interviewed and the stories that they told, um, which is one thing I love about this project. Um, but she also created a, um, a web page and put all of the, the stories on that web page as a way to share the stories more publicly and create some authenticity in that project. Um, so I'll leave that there for you to check out if you want. Um, but just a, just a really great way to, to, to build an authentic audience and, and give students the opportunity to feel like they're doing something meaningful. And then finally, digital storytelling is a great way to develop foundational literacy skills. Students should be writing drafts of, and, and, and editing and iterating and revising those drafts um, before they record. Um, it's a great way to build academic vocabulary and content knowledge. Students can demonstrate content knowledge through the, the stories that they're creating. Um, great way to facilitate 21st century skills, especially creativity, communication, um, but also collaboration, critical thinking, um, to promote social emotional learning. We've talked about creating authentic audiences for student work to personalize learning like we talked about where students have some choice in what they're learning, how they're learning, and how they're demonstrating their learning. Um, and then finally to provide alternate, alternate modalities through which students can demonstrate their learning and meet curriculum standards. Um, you know, we know that students learn in different ways and um, some students are more vocal, some students are more visual. And so providing some choice in how they demonstrate their learning can really help to meet students' needs. And a quote I got from a KQED Teach uh, course, media literacy is the ability to access, analyze, evaluate, create, and act using all forms of communication. And so really, you know, in, in our contemporary society, literacy is it's about more than being able to read and write. Um, and creating media op uh, provides opportunities for students to have insight into uh, how media is created and helps them to, to be more critical um, viewers of media. So I just want to play this short one minute video, um, something that I edited. Um, so I guess it's an example of my own digital storytelling, um, focusing on podcasting here in uh, SFUSD. Um, the funniest project I ever did was in fifth period, where we had to record ourselves talking about a book we read. It was creative. You, you got to see the skill and talking. Yeah, you had to cooperate with your peers and kind of get a closer relationship. Today we're even doing a party where you're listening to everyone's uh, podcasts about those books. Vayan terminando su último podcast. If we are trying to get kids to talk about what they learn, this is one way we can approach their learning. You know, so have them tell the their narrative. Uh, through podcasts and things like that. Talk about voice and choice, right? They get to choose what they're doing and put it into their own voice and 
it, it becomes a really rich, uh, deep learning experience. When I gave him the assignment for uh, Soundtrap, he, he was so lively, he was interactive, making his own sound and stuff like that. So it was uh, exciting to see that part. It's like, wow, there's the other side that I didn't know about this child. So it's just a good opportunity to hear from, from students about um, you know, the engagement that they, they experience through a podcasting project. Okay, so I'm gonna pass it on to um, Aaron Vong from Voice of the Witness, who's gonna facilitate an activity and, and share some of the resources that they have for us. Awesome, thank you, Stu. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Aaron Vong. I work with Voice of Witness. And um, Stu, if you wanna just jump ahead to uh, the mission statement, and I'll come back to this. Yeah. Um, thank you. So just a brief overview. I recognize a couple of the names in this chat, so you've heard me say this before, but Voice of Witness is a very small nonprofit. We're based in San Francisco, and we're an oral history-based organization. So our goal is to advance human rights by amplifying the voices of people impacted by injustice. And we do this through sharing first-person narratives. And so we have a book series that covers various issues, a lot of different content areas. We focus a lot on issues of displacement, migration, and the criminal justice system in the US. But we take our methodology and expand it out of these core issues and bring it into classrooms and communities all over. And I've been lucky enough to work really closely with the libraries department in SFUSD. And we've been able to conduct some oral history projects, which have taken many different forms, including podcasts, but not limited to them. So I will uh, confess that as much as I love technology, I am not the expert in it, but I know the basics. But my real goal is to help students figure out how to do an interview, literally how to create the questions, how to sit down with someone, how to get them comfortable, and where is the story that people really need to hear. And then figuring out how to share it all is a group effort with people like Stu and Justin at Soundtrap and Rachel at KQED who are much more experienced in the tech side. Um, but that's just a brief overview of all the stuff we have to offer. So my goal here today is to just have you all do a practice interview activity, a little icebreaker. That is something that um, I have expanded into the classroom and that you could expand into a whole project if you want. So uh, Stu, I believe, asked everyone to bring an object, an artifact that is meaningful to you in some way. If you didn't select one before, that is the one benefit of why we are all virtual and in our homes. You do have, hopefully, an object nearby that you could grab and talk about today. But uh, I love to, I'll just set up the parameters for this interview. So we're going to put you all into breakout rooms in pairs. And you will uh, decide who's going to be partner A, who's going to be partner B. And you'll have four minutes for each person to play a role of interviewer and what we call narrator, the person being interviewed. So for the first, first four minutes, partner A is going to interview partner B about their object. We're going to send out a broadcast little chat notification for when to switch. And then partner B will interview for four minutes. And then we'll send you a little warning before we close the breakout rooms. But that's the premise. It's a very short interview because, of course, we are short on time in this little session. But the idea was just to give you a taste of what the interview was like. And I chose the artifact interview because it grounds the interview in something concrete. For a lot of students and family members, and especially those uh, where English is not the first language, it can be really difficult if you sit, just sit down and start asking, like, who are you? What is your story? So having an object sort of grounds the interview and gives them some place to jump off from. And in this case, it helps you condense your story into the four minute period I've given you. So uh, uh, in the next slides too, I've just put up a couple sample storytelling questions that you might wanna use. Just really basic, what is your artifact? Why did you choose it for today? Is there a specific memory you associate with this? And will you pass this along to someone else? Uh, these are not questions you have to answer. This is something I go over with students a lot. Questions are not a checklist. You should honor your own curiosity and ask what makes you curious. What do you wanna hear from someone? But these are just to get you started in case you need a little nudge. So uh, with that, Stu, I think is setting everyone up for the breakout rooms. But um, I will be here in the main room, so you can come back here if you have any questions. But otherwise, he's going to set you off in a moment. And hopefully, you have an object that you want to share about. All right, Stu, if you could go uh, one slide forward, that would be great. Thank you. 
All right. So um, just very briefly, because we are short on time, I wanted to do a little interview debrief. So if you want to answer some of these questions in the chat box, uh, we can read through some of your responses. But basically, you know, how much were you able to learn in this very short exchange? Did it feel different being the interviewer versus the narrator? Did one role come more naturally to you? Sometimes people expect to be better at sharing their story and it turns out they're actually great at asking questions. And did anything surprise or challenge you during this interview? And of course, don't forget to thank your narrator for sharing their story. If you want to send them a private message during this chat, you can. And here come some responses. Awesome. Gregory says they learned a lot and it ended up being more of a conversation than an interview, which is fantastic to hear. We, we use the term oral history, but we try not to uh, use it all the time because it sounds kind of stuffy and academic. And we love oral history to be more of a conversation and more of a, a sharing activity. So Rachel shared about how her partner Daniel shared a super cool bluegrass banjo, which is awesome. And I don't think I've seen a banjo in this artifact interview yet. I'm always pleasantly surprised by the objects people bring. A lot of people were surprised to hear how things, they had things in common. That's awesome. This is great. It's, and Jamie says, it felt more natural, but also more vulnerable being the interviewee or the narrator, which is wonderful. Vulnerab vulnerability is a big thing and something we work really hard to develop to create the environment where people are comfortable doing that. Lucia got stuck with internet connection issues, which I'm sorry, that is a problem in our new virtual interview world and something we just have to work around, unfortunately. These are some great stories. I hope everyone's just taking a moment to go through uh, the chat and look at everyone's responses because this is amazing. Gloria says that having an artifact was helpful. Yes, I'm glad you found that. Judith has, has an artifact tied into education and it is a Spanish English dictionary from high school in the 1940s. Definitely have not seen that object before. Susanna has a letter from her student. That's awesome. Donna, again, feels like the interview was more like a conversation. This is great. Well, I just wanted to say thank you to you all for being so willing to jump into that activity uh, with very little prep. I promise in uh, an actual class, I provide a lot more context, but because we are all educators here, I thought you might be able to jump in very quickly, and you did. And it is a testament to how open you all are that you were willing to share stories about yourself. But I think it also says something about how we are all really eager to share stories about ourselves. And that's something our students need to learn is that people do want to talk, people do want to share, and we just have to ask the right questions. So thank you all. Uh, so before I jump off and turn this over to the rest of your awesome guest speakers. I just wanted to share a bit about what we offer at Voice of Witness. Um, so on the next slide, I have my contact information, but you could of course reach out to Stu um, for it as well. Or I know a number of people in the district. So if you mention Aaron at Voice of Witness, they might have my email, but it is very e easy to remember. It's just Aaron at voiceofwitness.org. Please email me at any time if you have questions or want support. You should also check out our website. We have a lot of resources there that are free to download. Our social media has a bunch of stuff as well. There's a lot of student project examples on there. Um, but I am here from now until <laughs> the end of my time to support you and your projects. And I am happy to support in any capacity. So these are projects as small or as big as you want them to be, as tech heavy or as primitive as you want them to be. But I'm here to help create that environment in your classroom for these types of storytelling activities. So please reach out and yeah, I'm really happy you all were able to participate today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Erin, for being here and um, facilitating that activity. And um, I, I should have mentioned earlier when I was sharing that project that Bruna uh, facilitated at SOTA with the, with the students. That's something that Erin 
um, worked uh, worked worked on as well. So and, and played a big part in. So um, just want to give give credit to that. Um, so yeah, thanks thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Um, okay, so now we're gonna um, do an activity where you're gonna uh, learn a little bit about how to edit in Soundtrap and then work together to create sort of the, be the beginnings of a podcast. Um, so I'm excited to uh, hand it over to Jocelyn, who's going to facilitate this um, part. Nice. Thank you, uh, Stu. Let me share my screen. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, hello, everyone. So as Stu mentioned, um, I'm here representing Soundtrap for Education. Uh, my name is Jocelyn Grimes. Um, I live here in LA right now. I'm a former teacher. Um, I told my group that I taught kindergarten and first grade. Um, definitely have many stories around uh, that journey. But um, yeah, I'm an education specialist uh, with the Soundtrap team here. I'm going to be actually supporting uh, San Francisco Unified um, this whole school year and with the implementation of Soundtrap and basically creating podcasts and stories. So I'll give you a little bit of background for those that don't know much about us, and then we'll actually go into the studio and I'll show you some, um, some different features we have. So um, for those of you that did not know, um, we, are, we were bought by Spotify um, back in 2017. And so Spotify really wanted to, um, their mission is to unlock the potential of human creativity. Um, so they wanna make sure that any creator or any music maker is able to really profit off of like their music and their creation. Um, but where Soundtrap comes in, we have a creator side and we also have an EDU side, which is our education side. But we wanted to make um, a professional um, quality creation more accessible for performers. So we always like to say that we want to make sure that those bedroom performers, such as the Billie Eilish's and the Lil Nas X's and all the other mus musicians and creators are able to create within their homes. Um, and seems like a perfect time right now for not only our students, but teachers as well to create in their homes and to have a tool that you don't have to spend thousands and millions of dollars on where you can really just create a podcast or music sitting at your kitchen table, you know, sitting on the couch from the welcomes of your phone or your computer. So like I said, we really want to make sure that we engage uh, people through um, creativity and collaboration. We want to elevate those stories and we also want to like uplift our stories. Um, I know that um, someone mentioned earlier that maybe some of our students don't like to like write with pencil and paper. So we give them soundtrack um, for them to be able to record their voice or to sit down and make some beats or music, depending on how like they're feeling. Um, how this soundtrack connects to like academic content. Um, we want to bring imagination of ideas and sounds to life. So I'm very big on when I was a kindergarten teacher giving my students a blank piece of paper and saying, okay, you have five, five to six minutes and I want you to just draw um, anything that you feel has come to your mind. And then we came to the carpet and we shared our stories. So now I know that when students, while students are home, their imagination is so bright. So we really wanna make sure that we're tapping into those skills. Um, it explores a new creative uh, writing form. So instead of like, like we said before, like writing, we're able to like speak into a, um, an audio recording. Um, we want to make emotional connections. Um, but the thing that I want to tap on the most is being authentic and being passionate. Um, and, and I know that Stu mentioned this earlier. I think that when we tell stories, we want to make sure that we're being as authentic as we can, because that's when we're most vulnerable and able to like really get our, our thoughts. Um, but we also want to be passionate as well. I think that through audio creation and music creation, we're able to see that our students that, you know, are the ones that are maybe beating on their desk with the, the, the pencils or the pens, they're actually musicians and they want to really create as well. So I'll actually go out of this presentation and I will go into Soundtrap. And Stu, correct me um, if I'm wrong, everyone within the district has access to Soundtrap right now, correct? Awesome. So everyone uh, within this district, you all um, have access to Soundtrap and you're able to go in and create music or podcast. Um, so right now when I went into, I'll go, actually go back. So when you log in using your San Francisco Unified credentials, um, you'll see um, like this profile page that may look like this. Um, I go over to my projects and I click enter into the studio. 
Um, just while that's loading, can I just clarify one thing? So yes. everybody in the district had access the entire year last year as part of a pilot that runs through August 30th. Um, people who are in the PLC will continue to have access to Soundtrap. Nice. Okay. Thank you. So once this comes up, you have we have our music side and we have a podcasting side. So today we're really going to focus on the podcasting side, but I would encourage you all to go over to music to check that out as well. So if I hit podcast, once this com comes up, it's very accessible. Um, I think that what I always tell teachers when we're starting to work with students in podcast creation, um, you want to allow them to just get in and just press buttons. And I know sometimes we're very afraid of that because it's like, okay, I don't know what they're going to do. But trust me, um, if they're able to go into the studio and do these things, it'll be more comfortable for them once they start creating. So I'll go over to the right hand side and we have loops. So loops are just our pre recorded sounds that we have in here, we have over like 900 pre recorded sounds that you can go in, and you can find. So for example, what I'll do really quickly, I'll do like um, a three, a three part loop, which basically is a piano, bass, uh, and a drum. And so what I'll do is I'll hit piano. And as you see, you can like scroll down and select any ones that you want. And you can preview them by just hitting the play button. So let's just hit preview. And if I want to favorite, favorite it, like like it, I just hit the heart over here and you'll be able to go back and, and find it later. So I'll just hit this. And then I will go and I'll add in a bass. And then my last one, I'll go and I'll add um, a drum as well. So I'll go in a drum. All right, and so as I said, this is something that we you can always start off as like a beginner project. Um, and well, all I did was went over to the loops once again, found the loops that I like, and you can either click and drag it into the studio, or you can just double click and it'll appear right over here. So I'll just show you what this sounds like all together. And like I said, I just pulled these three um, together. <laughs> Like I said, really simple, really easy um, to do. Um, you can also, what's really cool about this is you can bring in sounds, say that if we wanted to hear people talking. So people talking, let's see if that comes up. Let's see, uh, talking. So if we wanted to act as if we're in the street, there are street sounds, there's a young crowd talking. If we want to, if there's like an airplane sound, let's see, airplane. We can act as if we're like in an airport. You can bring those sounds in. So it really, once again, just brings in the creativity of your students that are within your classroom. Um, another thing that I want to mention is that once you're in the studio and these sounds are here, you can go and we can edit them. And so how, so say if I wanted to kind of, um, kind of fade in or fade out, what I would do is I would just go up here to like the top uh, left-hand corner and then you'll see those two arrows that pop up and it says fade in. So I'll just click and I'll just bring it down, drag it over that way. Or I can do the same thing with this. And if I wanted to make this um, fade out, I could just click once again up here at the top right and drag it down. I'll stop right there. Um, and Stu, are there any like questions that I should address like right now, or do you want me to continue to go? I think we've addressed them all, but if I if I see one, I'll let you know. Okay, nice. Um, so like I said, we can do that. Um, or if I wanted to bring this loop in some more, what I can just do is I can click on the side and just drag it in that way, drag it back out. Once again, bring this in. Could bring this in some more and so i'll go back and play what like i did with those quick edits that i made so this is what it sounds like so 
as I said, I was I just faded in, I faded out, and I brought like those tracks closer to one another. Now we'll get to the part where I can actually do a voice recording. And so this is something that what I see a lot of teachers, and I've seen a lot of teachers do, whether it be morning announcements, whether it be giving a direction on how to do an assignment, or as simple as um, just kind of like looking at like fluency or um, giving an oral history of someone that you're interviewing. You can just go over to the left-hand side where it says add new track. So I'll just click on the plus. And this um, box is gonna come up and you just hit voice and microphone. And before you start, you wanna make sure that all the settings are correct. So you wanna make sure that your voice is set to podcast. But if you click on it, you can see that you can change your voice to different like settings depending on where you are. Um, you wanna make sure that your microphone is set. You don't have to have a, a fancy expensive microphone. I just have my headphones right here and we always encourage like um, teachers and students to have um, just headphones as well. And so when I start recording, I'll bring this over and what I call this like purple, like line is like our marker that just uh, designates like where we are in the project. So I'm gonna bring this over because I don't want my voice to be talking over like the loops. So what I'll do is I'll just hit record right here. And then I can go down here and I can just hit record. Hey, we're at Digital Day for SFUSD. I'm here teaching the teachers how to do an intro to a podcast. I'll go back and just drag it back. I hit recording off. And right now I'll just play my voice. Hey, we're at Digital Day for SFUSD. I'm here teaching the teachers how to do an intro to a podcast. Nice. That's really as simple, like, as it can be um and if you think about like you want to designate who's on on certain tracks you can name the actual track so i'll just go over here just hover over double click and can just type um jocelyn's track and just click away so those are like some of the basic features that you can do so i just recorded my voice and i put some loops uh within the studio and I can, so this, these tracks are like movable. So you just click on it and you can go back right, left, right, left. So I'll just back it up a little bit. And then I'll take this back some. And we'll put all three of these um, together. digital day for like I said, those we just once again I just put a vocal track in and I just put loops in together so the next thing that I'll show you all how to do um, is our transcription feature and so I always think this is the the craziest and the coolest feature ever because you can actually transcribe whatever you said in the studio directly there um, you don't have to go, you don't have to download anything, take it somewhere else to transcribe it. It'll transcribe it for you within the studio. So how I did that, how I do that, as I go up to the top where it says settings, I go down to podcast tools and just make sure that the transcript is turned on. But then what I'm going to do next is go down to the, sorry, the bottom right, sorry, the bottom left. And you want to click on transcript. Then I'm going to select my voice track and I'm going to se select to transcribe my own track, the one that I'm talking on. You can't really transcribe loops just because it's music and there's no like audio talking there. So I'm just gonna hit transcribe for my voice. I'm just gonna confirm that it's my actual track. And it shouldn't, um, it takes about a minute to upload. And so while it's doing that, I'll stop once again for any questions that anyone may have or something that you would like for me to go back over. Nice, okay, if there aren't any questions, we'll just, um, 
I'll show you one more feature before the transcription pops up. So another thing that I know that a lot of you are probably wondering like, well, how am I gonna collab with my students? How are they gonna be able to do group projects with this? We actually have a collaboration feature in there where you can invite your students. So how you do that, you just go over to the right hand side where this blue like till tillish button, click on it. And right here you'll see where it says like invite. So you're able to click on invite and you can um, invite your students three different ways. You can invite them with email or name. You can share a link with them as well. You don't, um, San Francisco Unified does not have the feature to um, interview a podcast guest in terms of like a video call just because of like privacy reasons. Um, but there is an option where you can do that. Um, but like I said, you can invite someone just by typing their name in. So I'll type one of my teammates name in and see if it comes up. Um, let's see, Taylor. Actually, his name doesn't come up right now. I can't find him, but I'll show you in a project where I invited him in. But then, once again, this is the way that you can invite someone in a project. Once again, by coming over to the collaborators, inviting them, either their name or their email address, or sharing a link with them. Um, I'll go back and check my transcription. Yep. So this is the transcript from my voice. And so what I'll do is click out of this. Let me go back to the beginning of my vocal track and I want you to watch this is going along. So I'm going to play it. Hey, we're at Digital Day for SFUSD. I'm here teaching the teachers how to do an intro to a podcast. So as you saw, you have to be very clear and articulate when you're saying like everything. Um, it's about 98% percent chance that it's going to pick up everything but once again, you just got to make sure that you're clear on um, with the words that you're saying but it is it's going to read it exactly word for word what you said um and i know i know a lot of people have been asking maybe like how does this work like fluency or how does this work like closed captioning what you can do is um, i always recommend teachers to just uh copy their text and open up a google doc and just paste it in the text that way and so you can kind of like track what the students are saying or give them like uh, a hard copy as well and when they're actually going through their whole interview process or creating a podcast for themselves they can see the words or they can go through the editing process and say okay we don't like this we can take it out let's go back and re-record again and so those once again i always tell people to save as well you always want to make sure that you're saving your projects just so that you know we can be safe and you can also, you can name your projects. So I'll just do SFUSD demo. And I'll just hit save. And that's how you can, it's just as simple as doing an intro with some loops as well. Um, once again, we're gonna be supporting you all throughout this entire school year. So we can do some more like in-depth, like training of exactly what editing looks like or what intros look like. But just today I wanted to show you how to record your voice and how to add loops and how to invite people as well. So I actually created a project um, on last week that I would like to show you all. It's just it's like a one minute um, project that I created. So I'll play it for you. Welcome to Teacher's Lounge a podcast examining all things social justice related in schools and community engagement while amplifying the many black and brown voices that are making transformative and influential changes in K through 12 education. I'm your host, Justin Grimes. This episode one titled Tip and Chat, where we'll be diving into day one of 180 of the virtual classroom and what education is looking like in an age where technology, equity, and diverse voices are the leading factors. I'm a poet and I'm a teacher. And so much of my work is informed by the lives of my students, their families, and our community. I see it as an opportunity to tell the stories of my students' lives and break them out of these cultural caricatures that they're too often compartmentalized in. Those are the words of educator, social justice activist, and poet Clint Smith. 
In this episode, Clint stopped by the teacher's lounge to share with us strategies and ways in which we can change our perspectives in reshaping the narratives of our students in the classroom. Like I said, this is what I did, put an intro, um, track in, I labeled my track. I had like, I interviewed a guest, uh, Clint Smith, which I honestly, you can just, I went to YouTube, found a video that he was talking in and recorded that small like track of him talking. And I went back, um, just recorded that and it, it picked it up. Um, then I added some, some loops in there and I did some editing features. Um, and then also, as you can see on the side, I wanted to make sure you, sh you see that collaboration feature. I, collabor I invited two of my teammates, Chad and Jess, and as you can see, just put comments in there and you can see when like someone appeared in the project and when they left as well. So this is another great tool where if you have a group project and you want to keep constant feedback with your students, you can do that as well. And um, I use this like template that uh, Stu provided me with, um, which he just kind of gave me a framework of what to say in a podcast intro. I just copied and paste that, this whole section right here. And I put it in a Google Doc and I just kind of went through and added my own touch to it. And then I used Adobe Spark when we're thinking about like branding and logos, just went to Adobe Spark and I created this, um, like this would be like my podcast like template or like when you click on my podcast, this is what you would see, the teacher's lounge. So I just created this within Adobe Spark. And if I go back to this project, I'm gonna actually exit the studio. Let's see. Go to my projects. And as you can see right here, part of my projects, I was able to upload my own logo right here. And I can just listen to the sample of my podcast just by hitting play. Right here. So I'll stop for questions and Stu, let me know what would you like for me to do uh, next. Awesome. I think um, I've been trying to keep up with the questions. I okay. think we've answered them okay. in the chat, but lots of uh, positive comments too about people loving this and um, yeah, just, just loving the demo. So yeah. thank uh, you so much for that. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so like I said, we're, we're going to be myself and other teammates will be supporting the district this year. Um, if you all have any ideas that you want to like uh, shoot uh, by me or anyone else, feel free. I'm actually going to be hosting, um, what I call lesson redesigns, where you bring me either a lesson or a unit you're thinking about incorporating podcast in, and we kind of work through it in a framework and figure out how we can add certain elements um, to, to, you know, make your uh, lesson more creative and collaborative as well. But um, feel free to email me with any questions. I'll put my email, I'll stop sharing, I'll put my email in the chat. If there are any questions that you all have, always feel free to reach out. Um, actually, two questions I'll just raise. One was about how you got the interview from YouTube into Soundtrap, and then another one was about languages um, gotcha. that Soundtrap's available in. Yes, I'll go over that. Thank you. Um, so how I was able to actually record that voice, honestly, I went to YouTube. I just had a YouTube tab up, and as soon as he started talking, I hit record um, within the, the studio on Soundtrap. So Soundtrap. So it just picked up everything that he said. And I was able to go back in and edit, like, you know, exactly the piece that I wanted. Um, and I also show you that language feature that I know that um, a lot of people are asking about. Um, I'll go back to the studio. So I'll show you right here. So if you go to settings up here at the top, you go down to languages, you're able to set the language um, however uh, you would like, depending on, you know, the languages that are within your classroom. So you can't, so if I wanted to uh, translate it to Spanish, I couldn't do that. But you would just, if I wanted to speak Spanish into the studio, I would just, before I start recording, make sure that I set my um, setting to Espanol and then start my recording that way. But great question. All right, awesome. Um, I think, uh... I might, should I take over presenting? Sure. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, wait, hold on. I gotta get, give me one second. Okay. 
Okay. Um, thank you, Justin, for that demo and Absolutely. all the context around storytelling and creativity and, uh, and igniting the imagination of our students. That was awesome. I love that. And a lot of people in the chat were, were uh, super excited about that too. Thank you. Appreciate no it. Problem. Thank you. Um, so I think we're, we're a little uh, behind on time. So we were going to do this collaborative activity where you make a podcast. I think we might pause on that and go to KQED because I want to make sure they have an opportunity to share the amazing resources that they have for you. Um, and just knowing that people can go into Soundtrap and, and apply what you learned and, and play around. And um, it's super fun. I highly encourage you to do that. I was saying at the beginning of before we started, um, my nephew and niece are here and we're going to make a song when I'm done with work. And they've been asking me about it all day because they heard me playing around it, on it this morning. So um, yeah, it's just pe people love it. So, um, but I will just share with you, at least for now, uh, there is a link to the scaffold for writing your intro that you can use with students. And there are links to just short audio clips of um, intros from Radio Lab and This American Life. You can always choose different uh, podcast intro examples, but just to like preview those with students. Um, definitely have students listen to podcasts and you know analyze podcasts before you go into a podcast and activity uh, or project. And then there's some roll cards here. If you click on that, it'll it'll take you to the file. Um, so you might think about using group roles because podcasts are they're created by groups of people who are collaborating and people have specific roles. And so you might you might rotate those roles so students get um, opportunities to practice different skills. Um, but that can be a great way to structure a collaborative um, podcasting project, um, which I think can make it easier for you to manage the, the amount of podcasts that are being submitted. But it also gives students an op opportunities to develop collaboration skills and, and engage in a really authentic project. Um, and Adobe Spark is a great tool. Like Jocelyn said, he made his, um, his logo there. Uh, there's a three minute tutorial here you can check out. It's really, it's pretty, a sim pretty simple tool and you can make some really cool graphics. Um, and uh, I'll also just share, and this is just something you can run with your students. Um, we were gonna have you share, when you're done with your podcast, download it and upload it to a slide deck, a shared slide deck so you can listen to each other's um, you could listen to each other's podcasts and comment. Um, so this is here for you if uh, you want to like adapt this for your your classroom. Um, but here's an example where we've got Jocelyn's logo in here and um, let's see I might need to be in present, present mode. Um, uh, so we've got Jocelyn's logo. <laughs> Then his podcast in there. And um, so that's something that's kind of new with slides that um, you can insert audio uh, from Google Drive. Um, so that'd be a good way to like share, have students share their podcasts as they're, as they're creating them to share drafts of their podcasts and get feedback from each other and iterate. Um, knowing these are new skills for students. And so we want to encourage them to have, we, we want to provide opportunities for them to get feedback and learn and, and improve on their project. Um, okay, and also there are some curricular resources here that uh, you definitely take advantage of. Um, NPR has a curriculum guide for teachers and a guide for students that kind of walks students through creating a podcast. Youth Radio um, has a DIY guide to making a podcast and then Soundtrap has um, some lessons for different subject areas. So I'll just leave you with those as, as resources that you can check out. And um, thank you, Justin. And I'm really excited now to, to pass it on to Rachel Roberson from KQED. Hi, everyone. Stu, can I drive? Can I yes. share my screen? Yes, well, absolutely. Be awesome. Yeah. Just because we're all over the place here. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. I'm it's so like, it's been amazing to hear from Justin and Aaron. Um, and so I'm just going to add uh, to your um, resource pile here, but there's a couple of different things. Uh, that I want to share with you right now um, around KQED's educational resources. And a lot of you know here in the district that KQED, in addition to, you know, your radio news and your TV news um, and all of that, your arts and science news, has an entire education department um, it to uh, 
serve you um, in your students. Um, so we're going to talk about a, a lot of these things today, and these slides are also in the shared deck, so you can access them um, on at your leisure. Um, but all of these different things are linked. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our Media Academy for Educators, and this is basically like a information transfer to you right now. Um, so we're going to get interactive later when we talk about a specific audio project or video project you can do with students. Um, but we just launched our Academy for Educators, which is an online space um, for professional development around media and project based media making and deeper learning. Um, and we have courses, um, cohorted courses, which means they're time bound um, and instructor led, um, which means you get feedback on every assignment, but they're not synchronous. So you don't have to sign on in any particular particular time, you can sign on when you want um, within that time frame. Um, and the time frames are three or six weeks. And so we had the four courses. Um, these are the four courses that we're offering kind of in a rotating basis. Um, so video production, podcasting and audio production is actually up next, amazingly. Um, graphic and interactive media production and analyzing and evaluating media for the classroom, which is happening now. And some of you might actually be taking the class right now. Um, and so, again, our podcasting and audio production in the classroom course starts August 24th. Again, it is asynchronous. So within the six weeks that it's being offered, you actually have a bonus week, we should say. You have until October 9th to finish everything. Um, so in the six weeks plus a bonus week that it's offered, um, you can sign in any time and work through the assignments. The assignments are all completely aligned with what you'd probably be doing anyway if you were designing an audio project um, using Soundtrap or another amazing um, tool. Um, and it, uh, the whole kind of rotation of courses helps you earn PBS um, Media Literacy micro-credentials, um, which is a part of the PLC. So these micro-credentials aren't just sort of check off, take a course, done. Um, they show competency in both the skill and teaching practice. Um, and so they're independently evaluated. Um, you know, we don't evaluate them. They're independently evaluated through um, the Digital Promise site. But um, as a teacher, you're just basically turning in artifacts that you already do, like lesson plans, anonymous student work, rubrics, that kind of thing, to show that you have um, used um, media literacy tools in your teaching practice. So um, that's kind of, and then if you get all eight, you can become media, PBS Media Literacy uh, Educator Certified, which is exciting, but it might not be for you, but um, it is for some people to show leadership in that way. Um, but mostly it's all around helping students, um, you know, build the skills that we've been talking about this afternoon, right? So taking um, what you, they're learning in your class, um, applying it, learning, um, and then you as a teacher can earn the micro-credentials um, through the support of the courses, but you don't have to take the courses. That's what that big blue arrow says. If you just apply the skills in your, in your classes, you don't have to take any courses to apply for micro-credentials. You can earn them at any time. So um, our podcasting and audio production in, in the classroom starts on August 24th. Um, and it's basically divided into three basic weeks. We're really into learning by doing at KQED. Um, we believe that you as educators, um, by doing the things that you want your students to do, um, will build your own competency, excitement, and confidence uh, to teach it. So we always start by having you learn something um, and make something yourself, just like Justin had us jump in right now um, and start sort of like seeing how we can make things. Um, so that weeks one through three is really you making an audio model for a project that you want to do with students. Um, and then weeks four to six is all about preparing to implement it. So again, doing things that you do anyway, writing an assignment guide, writing a rubric, um, investigating tools to make sure that privacy and safety of your students will be um, okay while they're doing the project, writing a unit plan, um, creating a model to show them and, and helping them analyze that model. So all the things that you would do as an educator to prepare for a big project, you do as part of the courses uh, and you get feedback um, from us at KQED and your instructors. And you also get to see what other teachers all over the country are doing um, around the same thing. Um, right now in our uh, analyzing media course, we have over 400 teachers from all over the country and actually the world um, sharing what they're doing with their classrooms. So you have access to all of that as well. And so it's a really great community of practice, as well as a chance for you to kind of get some feedback as you work through the things that you're planning to do anyway. 
Um, so in the weeks three, you can, you do everything you need to do to earn um, one of the micro credentials that Stu mentioned before, which is um, the micro credential for ma making classroom media audio and video production. So that you earn that by making your own model of media to use in instruction um, and then sharing how you use it and reflecting on it. And then in weeks four and six, you prepare to implement the project, you write that assessment, you write the unit plan, you actually implement it. Um, and then you're doing all the things that add up to three more micro credentials. So again, the courses aren't necessary, they're not required. You don't have to um, take the course in order to earn a micro credential, but the courses support you in that journey. Um, and the way that they support you is by helping and supporting you as you're doing the things that you would do to prepare for a project with students. So the instructor feedback, every assignment you get feedback. There are no grades, but we use <laughs> some symbols um, to kind of see how, um, so you can kind of see how you're doing. Um, so this is how it looks like on the site. I might have to sign in. Oh yeah, I don't have to sign in. So, you know, this teacher um, created this lesson and then she posted it. And then, oh, you, you, you don't see the feedback, but if I was signed in, you'd see the feedback that says, great job. Um, that you were doing uh, all the things that you needed to do to earn that micro credential. And then there's a kind of a back and forth that's um, that you can have. You can talk to the, the uh, folks on the site and you can talk to the instructors. So it's the kind of thing that there's a lot of different levels to this kind of learning. And again, thank you for your patience. I'm just kind of brain dumping, but I want kind of to um, everyone to know what's accessible. Um, these are obviously free to you. Um, and there's a lot of different levels that go on um, when this is happening. Um, we had a high school teacher who did our video production course, you know, learn a lot about video production, but also learn a lot about how to do online instruction. So there's kind of a lot of different meta levels happening when you're taking an online course at the same time that you are designing and implementing your own courses online. Um, and then again, it's very practical. And so you take what you're learning um, as this librarian talks about, um, and you're kind of asked to do what you would do anyway. So it's not just read this, think about this, it's actually read this, think about it, do it, um, share it, and um, it helps with implementation to get that immediate feedback as well as just kind of going through the steps and seeing what other teachers are doing at the same time. I see that the chat is kind of popping, so um, I just, to interrupt, yes, uh, any questions that anyone has, you can uncover your mic or post them in the chat. Um, someone was asking just about like what, it, what the purpose of the micro credentials, I guess. Yeah, the micro credentials, there's, I mean, it's, it's a way for you to get feedback on how you're doing and kind of show that you've gained skills in a certain area. And so the micro credentials are, are just a way to do that. Um, you get a badge, you can share it um, as, as you will, um, but it's also a way to sort of let you know kind of how it is that you're implementing these media literacy skills. That's a great question. It's certainly not required in terms of, you know, implementing uh, media in your classroom, um, but it is a way to reflect um, the leadership and skills that you're developing. That's a great question. Gino asks, anyone do this with students who are nonverbal or students with special needs? That's a great question. I don't have the answer, but I hope someone can answer that. I actually chat. have something to offer for that because we, we did um, an assessment of the pilot last year and one of the teachers shared that um, they had success with a selectively mute student um, creating a podcast. So a student who in social situations ha is, is sort of nonverbal non to an extent. Um, but felt comfortable creating a podcast and, and that was, um, they were able to successfully do that. Awesome. And I also can echo, we work with a lot of teachers on audio production and a lot of them say, you know, I didn't hear, I hadn't heard the student's voice before they turned in their podcast. Um, the student didn't participate in class, wasn't, didn't feel confident to do that, but the po podcasting project helped them share their voice. So I just echo what Stu said. All right, if there are no other questions, um, I'm gonna go on to a possible project that you might wanna think about doing if you're a middle or high school teacher um, with students. Um, KQED's Let's Talk About Election 2020 Youth Media Challenge, which is a great way for students to um, talk about issues that matter to them, 
um, and then share an audio or video piece that expresses that um, and share it with a wider audience than just their classroom. Um, going back to that triangle, that pyramid shape that Stu shared at the beginning um, of helping students engage not only with their fellow classmates and their, and their teachers, um, but with their schools and the community and the wider, the wider world. And so this is a project that helps students do that. So this is a, a quote that really, I think, becomes more and more relevant <laughs> as time goes on um, and, and in our changing world. It's just, to, it's just so important to give students an opportunity to share their voice and to use the digital tools that they have access to um, to make their voice heard in a wide variety of platforms and in a wide variety of ways. And so the election 2020 challenge um, really asks students and gives students an opportunity to do that around uh, an, an issue that matters to them. And so right now in the chat, I'd love for everyone to sort of jump in and say, you know, given what you know about your students, the students you had last year, the students that you're anticipating having soon, um, what kind of community, state, and national issues are important to them? Let's bring our students um, into the space with us through that. DACA, Karen says pr police brutality, community violence, absolutely, thank you. Immigration from Valerie, ableism, absolutely, Christine. Laurie says issues around race, equity, racism, homelessness, Black Lives Matter, sexual assault, the virus, food insecurity, sexual assault, ICE, housing, poverty, racial justice, education from Vincent. So these issues that you just dropped into the chat to bring your students' voices in are issues that affect our community here in San Francisco and also um, have wider implications throughout the United States. Um, there are also some issues that might just affect our communities. Um, and those issues are okay too. Um, in this Youth Media Challenge, students are invited to bring the issue that is on their heart, whether it's a national or international issue um, like climate change, or a very personal issue um, like trauma in my community or um, homelessness in my community. So there's a lot of different ways to approach this. Um, and again, with, with student choice and voice, the, the, the larger you open um, the, the door, the, the more will come in. So we're gonna hear from a student and I might have to stop sharing and sign in, but I think I should be able to hear from a student. This is a student from Michigan who has already posted to the Youth Media Challenge um, and his voice is uh, reflected of a lot of voices on the site right now. You may not notice it, you may overlook it, but racism is still present in our schools and it's been this way since schools were segregated to present day. Although it may not be as overt as it was in the mid 1900s, it's still here and present in our schools. Nowadays, racism is a word that is just thrown around or even joked about, but it's not funny. In fact, it's sad that some don't realize how it affects people of color. We don't like to be stereotyped, judged, or downgraded based on the color of our skin. Judge me based on my character. And for those who think the stereotypes are true, they're not. Don't play into them. We are who we are, unique in our own way. The teacher who said, you're smarter than I thought, or the lady gripping her purse as I walk by, has no clue what I've been through. The kids that assume I'm not smart because of my race don't know how hard the work is for me. In order to reduce racism in our schools, we need more people to come together. You can't escape it. You can't erase it. But in the end, you could be the one to stand against it. So again, that's an example of a piece of media that a student submitted for the Election 2020 Youth Media Challenge. Um, around an issue that was on his heart. He's in Michigan, but I know a lot of our students here in San Francisco would be able to relate to his message. The way that that challenge works is that students pick an election-related issue that matters to them. Again, it does not have to be huge. 
um, international. It can be something in the community, um, as long as it matters to them. And then they'll write an evidence-based commentary about that issue. And we know that commentary is, is something that involves both a personal connection to an issue as well as evidence-based argument and reasoning. And then they would create an audio or video piece. You saw a video piece just now. There are lots of powerful audio pieces as well on the site. Um, to, and then post to our publishing platform on KQD Learn to share their voice with others. Um, on the KQD Learn site, there is a map um, and it's really wonderful to see um, all the youth media that are, is on that map right now. So if you can see this, you can see that students already all are posting from all over the country. A lot of uh, our youth in San Francisco and the Bay Area have already posted, but there are other um, schools in Mississippi, Michigan, Milwaukee, Boston, and more each day um, sharing their voices on the site. Um, and this site is searchable, so your students can go on and see what other youth are thinking about different issues. You can view by issue, you can view by location just by clicking on the flag. And so there are lots of different ways for students to engage with each other through this project, in addition to making one of their own. And again, there are both video and audio um, stories on the site right now. There are also lots of resources on the site to, that you can use <laughs> to um, implement this and more being posted every day. Um, but you know, starting with what connects you to that issue and then doing some research about what, how your claim, how, supporting your claim with evidence and reasoning. And this is a wonderful and very powerful student uh, teacher created example. Um, he made this um, at San Leandro High for, as a model for his students doing the challenge. We don't have time to play it now, but I absolutely recommend um, that you listen to this teacher's audio um, example of an issue that was on his heart that he created and then shared with his students as a way of kicking off the project, um, letting them see what the project could be, but also sharing his own issue um, and kind of meeting them in that same place. And when we're talking about um, asking our students to engage in civic dialogue, um, we are all here together to engage in that kind of dialogue as members of the community. And so the teacher um, definitely took that first step by creating that model and sharing his own views about a certain issue with his community um, and then inviting his students to do the same. So uh, I wanna get to some questions. Students can respond to each other's presentations. Um, KQD Learn is a youth voice only site. And that means that while we as um, adults can see the media that's presented, um, we cannot comment, but youth can. And so students who are signed into the KQD Learn site can comment on each other's presentations. Um, adults can monitor what, you know, everything that goes on on the site, but we don't participate. Every voice on the KQD Learn site is a youth voice. Yes, um, Brad says, can some, something on the challenge be made um, with Adobe Spark? Um, yes, it can. You do need to upload any video to YouTube or Vimeo. You don't need to share it. You don't need to make it public. You know, you can share it. You can make it unlisted. Um, but in order to connect with the site, video needs to be uploaded to um, a streaming site since we can't, we don't have the space or the budget to host every single uh, video piece on our site. Um, but you can definitely create something with Adobe Spark. That's a great idea. Other questions about the Youth Media Challenge? As I mentioned, um, as everyone's mentioned, um, I'm here to support you. Um, and there are, there's many, many uh, resources on the site to support you. We also have some new Youth Media Challenges launching this fall and winter to just keep your eye out on um, since you'll become um, youth media masters um, by the end of this. Um, there, well, we're inviting students to record audio perspectives, which is audio op-eds um, of a more personal nature, kind of like the perspectives that you hear on KQED News if you do listen to the radio. We're inviting them to uh, submit audio stories. Again, a great way for them to tell their own audio story. It doesn't have to be issue-based, it can be about anything. We're also doing um, a If Schools Could Dance challenge, which is a video challenge around, um, based off our If Cities Could Dance um, show on KQD Arts. So um, what dance, what would your school look like if it could dance? How would you um, encapsulate and share your community in dance format? And then starting um, later on, we're gonna have also a political cartooning challenge 
um, that we're going to invite students to upload um, visual imagery and political um, cartoons around an issue that matters to them. So we have a lot of things going on around media making, but most important to remember is that we have a platform um, that again, that's completely free. Um, every, all of our resources are always free to you, um, but we have a platform that allows students to share their voice beyond just their classroom. And so whether you're doing an audio project about the election or another um, project, an audio story, a perspective, um, there is probably going to be a place for you to share it more widely and we'd love for your students to be uh, to join other students on the site. The election challenge actually runs through the election, the inauguration. So it actually runs through January. So you have until January to do um, the election 2020 challenge. Other questions? Again, to get started, uh, create a teacher account on KQD Learn. Again, it's a, it's a free account, but it'll give you access to all the resources um, around doing the challenges. I think that's it, Stu. All right, awesome. Thank you so much, for Rachel. That was awesome. Um, really appreciate you uh, stopping by to, to present all that. To, to oh, one more board. thing. Someone says, will KQD be a part of the PLC? And yes, absolutely, we will be. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. I guess I'll, uh, I'll take screen sharing back. Um, so yeah, those are some really exciting opportunities both to advance your own learning. I'm uh, currently enrolled in one of the KQED um, courses and uh, I have some catch up to do on my work, I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's awesome and, and, I, and I love it um, so far. So, um, and I'll probably be taking some of these courses throughout the year with, with many of you too. Um, so in the time we have remaining, uh, I'd love to have some time for people to kind of think about how they might um, design digital storytelling projects and the election 2020 is a great example of a project that's authentic it's um, it, it addresses the moment it gives an opportunity for students to speak to things that they care about that are meaningful to them and important to them um, and, and to have their voices heard and potentially make an impact and so it really integrates a lot of the elements of authenticity and public product that um, are part of our deeper learning framework that we're looking to uh, facilitate for students. Um, so I hope that people will take up that opportunity to um, plug into that project if it fits your, your teaching context. Um, there is a big push in our district to move towards deeper learning and um, so I wanted to share the this this framework for project design that comes out of the Buck Institute um, and this is sort of their gold standard for uh, for project-based learning design. Um, so they've identified these seven essential project design elements, um, starting with a challenging problem or question, providing opportunities for sustained inquiry where students are uh, learning and generating questions and, and really um, uh, learning, you know, depth into, into a topic. Um, authenticity, like we've talked about, where students can, can really make an impact and work on solving real world problems. Student voice and choice, where students have some choice over what they're learning and how they're learning and how they demonstrate their learning. Opportunities for reflection uh, through, you know, uh, around like the challenges that they faced um, through the project, how they overcame those challenges and, and various skill sets that, um, that they leveraged to help to uh, develop metacognition. Um, opportunities to engage in critique and revision and iterate and, and really foster a growth mindset and then opportunities to create a public product that, that can be shared with an authentic audience. So um, we've got uh, the ascent, this link here will take you to a web page, the, the web page on the Buck Institute that just gives some like brief overview of um, these seven elements of project design and there are also videos at the bottom that show examples of, of what projects look like that are incorporating um, these elements. I'm just thinking about time. Um, and then I put together a project planning template here to help you kind of develop your project, um, incorporating these, um, these elements of project, uh, project design. So I think what we'll do is um, maybe just take five minutes to kind of look through the website, access the template, and um, and start filling that out. And 
I'd like to have people, I, th I think we'll, next session we'll probably have people get together and, and um, present their projects and give feedback because I also want to give you an opportunity to fill out the application. Um, so take five minutes to kind of explore those resources um, and make a copy of a project planning template. And if you want to start brainstorming your project, that would be great. And then um, I'll move into closing and share the application with you. Um, so I'm going to bring us back together. Um, I would love to have time for people to kind of fill out their project and share with people. I think we'll have to do that um, next time we meet, but it j at least just wanted to share uh, that framework for designing a, a project using those essential design elements. Um, so we'll maybe build that into the next uh, session. Um, 
So I think uh, I'll just kind of close us out. Um, yeah, okay. Um, so there, like I said, there's an application to um, participate in the PLC. I would love to have everybody who's interested be a part of it, um, but I have to work within the budget constraints that I've been given. And so there are only so many Soundtrap and WeVideo licenses that um, I can provide. So uh, we're going to offer an application here for anybody who's, inter who's interested in um, continuing with the PLC. Please fill out an application looking for, we're, we're looking for, for sort of, um, you know, how your projects align with deeper learning um, and, you know, what kind of impact uh, you'll have in, in terms of helping our district move towards um, our goals around social justice and equity um, and just looking for impact on, on students, especially focal students. So please access that. I'll also throw, throw um, the link in the chat real quick. Okay, so I put a link to the um, application in the chat. Uh, go ahead and fill that out now if, if you'd like. Um, the other thing I was going to share with you is what options for tools you have if, if, you're, if you're not able to continue with the PLC and you don't have funds for Soundtrap and WeVideo. Um, Adobe Spark's a great tool that has a web page builder, builder, a graphic design tool, and a video editing tool. They're Base, you know, they're basic tools that are really easy to use, which makes them great for learners of all ages. Um, but they're also really powerful tools and you can create some really, um, really stunning media with Adobe Spark. So, you know, if, if you want to do a podcast and activity, you still might use the video editor, have people create a graphic or a logo for their podcast, like Justin did with Adobe Spark's graphic design tool, and then import that into the video editor and add their um, narration to the video and just have the video just be the, the, the icon for their podcast. And that would work just fine. They can still use music from the, the Adobe Spark music library. They can import their own music. Um, so that would work great uh, as, as a free alternative. Online voice recorder is also um, a free alternative for voice recording. Um, and they can do some basic editing like trimming um, their audio clips. Um, so using some kind of combination between online voice recorder, Adobe Spark, and then um, like we showed you how you can add audio to a Google slide, you could kind of um, use those to make a podcasting project work. So I put a, a short tutorial here to Adobe Spark video. If, if that is something that you end up using, you can access that. And um, that's it. I, th I thought I'd end a little bit early for so that people have time to fill out the application. And um, I'll stick around for the next eight minutes. I can answer questions. And uh, I want to thank everybody for, for coming, and especially our, our guest facilitators, Aaron and Justin and Rachel, for your presentations. Those are great. Um, I'm seeing somebody's asking about the three meetings. I will follow up with dates and times once the, the group is set. And I will be deciding um, by over, over the next week. So please submit your applications, you know, for the next few days, if not right now. I'm seeing that I was paused on sharing my screen. I apologize for that. Um, the slides were just, um, there's an application link to here. I also put it in the chat. And then um, these tools that you can use Adobe Spark and, and Voice Recorder.
I see someone's asking, when does the PLC need to be completed by, from Sarah? Um, the PLC will run throughout the year. Most of our meetings will be in the fall so that you can design and implement projects. And then we'll have a, a showcase in the spring. Yep, the session is over. Just wanted to end early to give people a chance to fill out the application. So you, um, you can stick around. I'll stick around to answer questions if, if you have any. Otherwise, you're welcome to go. <laughs>